Psalm 7, let's jump right in here. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Now, starting from this very first verse in Psalm 7, this is kind of a common theme that we're going to find throughout the Psalms. We've already mentioned, seen this mentioned a couple times, how God is our deliverer, God is our shield, God is our rock, God's our defense. Whenever we're in trouble, whenever we have hard times, whenever we're facing something that may be scary or fearful, that we can trust in the Lord. When enemies rise up against us, we can go to God. And I love that statement. It says, in thee do I put my trust. Our trust, you rely on the Lord. You're completely faithful and trusting God for everything. Now, obviously, if you're saved, if you're born again, you've already put your trust in Jesus Christ to save your soul. And this is what we usually try. I try to do as best of a job as I can out soul winning because We'll, we'll say verses, you know, like John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's a very familiar verse. A lot of people know that verse. And if you were to ask somebody if they believed in Jesus, in the United States of America, many people will say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But the, the folly that would come in is just assuming that everybody that says those words is actually saved. Now, does everyone that believes in Jesus, are they saved? Yes, but they have to actually be believing in Jesus Christ. It's easy to say the words. It's easy to believe on him. It's easy to say the words, but not everyone that says the words are, are understanding, I guess, what it means to believe in Jesus. And it's not complicated and it's not hard. And this is, this is a great truth when you talk to people. And I think this is also a reason why many new believers have a hard time discerning who's saved and who's not right off the bat. I know I did when I was a newer believer. Uh, after I got saved, right after I got saved, I kind of thought that pretty much all of Christianity, with maybe a couple exceptions, were saved. That they were, they were believers, they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're saved. But it's because I didn't really understand that many people who profess Jesus Christ are not saved because they're not trusting in Jesus Christ alone. And that's where we say here, indeed do I put my trust in Psalm 1. And, and what, we need to, what people need to understand and what we need to do a very good job of explaining to people when we, when we try to win people to Christ is the concept of trusting in Christ alone, completely, solely, 100% for their salvation. What do I mean by that? Usually I'll go into an example and say, you know, if you were to ask me before I got saved, if I believed in Jesus, I would say yes. And that's what I mean by this. Many people will say they believe in Jesus Christ. But you know what? I wasn't entrusting my soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't say, you know, if, if someone were to ask me, well, why would you go to heaven? I would probably say, well, I'm pretty good. You know, I try to keep the commandments. I go, you know, try to read my Bible. I, I haven't really done anything too wrong. Obviously, those are all just a bunch of works. And that is where the vast majority of people fall in today. They, they are believing in their good works. They'll tell you they believe in Jesus, but that's not where their trust is in order for them to be saved. Because what they do is they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe Jesus. He died on the cross and everything. But when you ask the questions and they start giving their good life and their good works, their trust, they're entrusting their soul to how well they're able to, able to obey God's commandments. And you all here tonight that are saved, that you've already put your faith in Jesus Christ, what you did is, is very simply, you're entrusting Jesus with your soul. You're saying, God, I can't make it to heaven. I've already failed. I've already sinned. I've already come short. So I'm going to entrust my salvation to you, Jesus, because I failed. I want you to become my savior. I want you to save me. And talk about trust. I mean, what, what more precious thing do you possess than your own soul? No amount of money can pay for your soul. No amount of goods or riches or anything else that you have, even a spouse or a child, 
If you don't have your own soul, you have nothing. So taking the thing that's probably most dear to you, your own life, your own essence, your own soul, and entrusting that to someone else, you need to have complete trust. Which, thank God, we have, we have a God that is completely trustworthy, and that is all he requires of us to save our souls, is just to trust him. Just put our trust in him, that, whatever, uh, that, that, that God is the one who's able to save us, that Jesus Christ is, is able to save us from our sins and we're just completely trusting that, which is why no matter how many good works you do before, during, or after, you know, you put your faith in Christ, none of that matters because your trust is on Jesus that he's saved your soul and he's given you a gift of eternal life. Now, if you're willing to make that, have that type of trust in Jesus to save your soul, we ought to have the same type of trust in every aspect of our life. And this is what we're going to be learning and seeing again as we continue through the book of Psalms and we see all these great songs, these great praise songs to God that, that are just helping us to remember, God, you know, thank you for being there for me. Thank you for me allow, allowing me to put my trust in you and allowing God to be our deliverer, our savior in every every meaning of the word, not just the savior of our souls, but the savior of us from everything, from destruction, from, from our enemies, from anything, any issues that we have in this life. We're going to entrust that to the Lord. That's where David's starting off here in verse number one. Oh Lord, my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. So in this, in this particular context of this verse, he's not asking him to save his soul. He knows his soul is already saved, but he's saying, Lord, I'm putting all my trust in you, God. Please save me from those pe these people that are persecuting me. They're coming after me. They're wrongfully persecuting me. God, please deliver me. And this is, this is the attitude that we ought to have. And we put our trust, and that's why we put our trust in God. We don't put our trust in a man or a person that can fail you or in some teacher that you like. In any, we don't put our trust in those people. We put our trust in the Lord to save us. The Bible says in Romans 3, 4, God forbid, yet, let God be true, but every man a liar. We know that God is true. We know God is just. We know that God cannot lie. But any given man, we know that every man's a liar. Every man is told a lie at least one point in their life. There's no getting around that. And if every man's a liar, how can, you, how can you trust a liar? Well, you can't completely trust a liar, but you, well, you, who you can trust is the Lord. You can trust God. And that's where our trust ought to be. Let's keep reading here in Psalm 7, verse number 2. He's going to continue on about who he needs deliverance from. That's what he says, Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces while there is none to deliver. O oh Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy. Now, he's bringing up these things because what's happening here, and then it says, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it, yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay mine honor in the dust, Selah. So, Basically, what he's saying is that, God, if I, you know, deliver me from these people. They're persecuting me. And if you don't deliver me, they're going to they're gonna tear my soul like a lion. They're going to rend me in pieces. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna destroy me, Lord. So, so help me out here. And then he, go, he continues further and says, God, look, if I've done this. And what are you talking about if I've done this? What he's talking about is if I've done the things that they're accusing him of. Because he's being falsely accused here. He's being persecuted, as verse 1 says. He's being persecuted. He's being, the, people are saying all manner of evil against him falsely for, for Jesus' sake is what I, I would interpret this. So my understanding is that uh, he's being accused of something. And he says, look, God, if I did this, if there's sin, if I've done wrong, Lord, if I've done this and there's iniquity in my hands, if I, and he says, if I have rewarded evil 
unto him that was at peace with me. If I just went and I harmed people and I did wrong to somebody who had, I had no reason to do wrong to, then basically he's saying, okay, then, then judge me. Then let the enemy continue to persecute me. Let me go through the hard times, but if not, then deliver me, Lord. Now, rewarding evil unto him that was at peace with me. The Proverbs says in Proverbs 17, verse 13, whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. There are people out there that do bad things to other people that the people they're, they're hurting don't deserve it at all. They didn't do anything bad to them, yet the evil person is going to do evil unto them anyways. And the people that do that, they shall not escape. The Bible says that evil shall not depart from his house. And David understands this. And what's also interesting is that, that parenthetical statement in verse number four. He said, if I reward evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy. He's saying, I've done the opposite. He's saying, you know, he's saying, if I did this and if I did, th did that, if there's iniquity, then go ahead and judge me. Allow me to go through this persecution, Lord. But in parentheses here, he's saying, but I have delivered. He says, I have saved those that without cause is mine enemy. They had no reason to be my enemy, but they're my enemy and they're doing bad to me, yet I still did good unto them. We see the heart of David here practicing what the Bible has always taught and what we see definitely in the New Testament where the Bible says, you know, to love your enemies and to do good to them uh, that hate you and, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And we, I, just, I just went over this not very long ago in another sermon, this same concept of having this type of love and, and that we ought to be able to uh, love, you know, even in the book of Psalms, we went over this where um, we love our enemies, but it's okay to have hatred towards God's enemies. And here we see David doing exactly that. He's loving his enemies. He says, look, I've saved those that without cause is mine enemy. And this is not some new commandment that's new to the, the New Testament or the Old Testament. Oh, everything's mean and everything's, everything's just, just harder or harsher. No, David was practicing this all the way back in Psalm 7 here, saying, look, I, I've helped them. I'm doing good to people that are mine enemies. So as a result, God, you know, you know, you know the truth, Lord. And that's what he's saying here. And this is what I love about, about David here asking God for deliverance and as encouragement for us. Because he is being accused of some kind of wickedness. And he's asking God to judge because God knows everything. So in verse 5, when he says, Let the enemy persecute my soul and take it, yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay mine honor in the dust. He's saying, I'm not afraid to take the punishment when I've done wrong. Why? Because David's a man of integrity. When he does wrong, he knows he does wrong. When he did wrong, even in his, in his grievous sins of adultery and murder, he accepted the punishment. He knew he did wrong. He begged for mercy, but he knew he did wrong. He didn't run away or try to, to bristle against the, the punishment and say, oh, I don't deserve this. And you know, we ought to have the same level of integrity. Jump down to verse number eight there in Psalm 7. The Bible says, the Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is in me. And let me ask you this, do you have such a bold stance? Would you, would you be willing to go in prayer to God and just go call on God and say, God, judge me according to my righteousness? David had a heart to be able to do that. We ought to be walking in the Spirit enough to have the confidence to say, God, you know, when, when things are going wrong, and we need help, and we want to pray to God to help us, we ought to, be, we ought to be at the place where we could just confidently say, God, help me, deliver me from the persecution, help me from the people that are rising up against me, they're lying about me, Lord, and you know what, God, go ahead and judge me. Judge me if I'm doing right or wickedly. If you're not very confident, 
then you ought to look at yourself and do something about it because the reason why people aren't very, wouldn't be confident is if you are in sin. If you're knowingly just in sin in your life and you have some wickedness, you're not going to want God to judge you. But when you're doing what's right and you're living righteously, you'll have the boldness to say, go ahead and judge me, God. And look, we know that we're not perfect, but there is a level of righteous living that you can live in to where God's going to be pleased with how you're living. And that is the place where we all need to be striving to be. And you, you, you ought to be asking yourself, can I say this to the Lord? You know, judge me. God, look at, it, look at all the circumstances. Look at everything that's going on in my life and just judge me. And all the problems that I'm having, and if I'm having all of these problems because of my sin, then you know what? I'm willing to accept that. I'm willing to take it. But judge me, Lord. And if, if, if I'm not in the wrong here, then deliver me. Save me out of my enemy's hands and help me. And that's what, that is what's being, uh, being said here. Now, what's interesting about this type of attitude, and like I said, you're not going to be able to do that when you have wickedness in your heart, when you, when you have sin in your life that's grievous especially, you're not going to be very bold to go to God and say, okay, go ahead, God, judge me. Because you know that God sees everything. Because you know that God knows the thoughts and the tents of your heart. And that's why we see today the prevalent attitude of this judge not. Oh, judge not. You can't judge me. Don't judge anything I do. Because you know who's, who's promoting that type of a, of a teaching? or a false doctrine of just, you can't judge anything, judge none. It's the people who have wickedness in their life. Why do they have that attitude? Because they don't want the light of God's word shined on their wickedness. They want to hide their sins. They don't want to know about it. So they say, oh, don't judge my fornication. Don't judge my adultery. Don't judge my drunkenness. Don't judge me. Don't judge me for all the things that I'm doing. Why? Because they're doing the things and they don't want to get right with God. So, and, you know, one, they're probably not going to, I mean, they're, they're going to judge the righteous person. They're going to be willing to judge the righteous person and say, you can't judge me. But they're not going to be going and able to judge anyone else. Otherwise, they'd be judging hypocritically. Now, Nobody ought to be judging hypocritically, first and foremost. And one of the problems that you could run into, and, and again, I don't want to get too much into detail on this because I just recently preached a sermon called Judge Righteous Judgment and two, actually two sermons about judging and our proper attitude and everything like that. But one of the traps would be when you do start to live more righteously, And you can get to the point where you say, God, judge me. Because you're not, you're not in such grievous sin. Beware of falling into the attitude of thinking that you're better than people who have sin in their life. And maybe looking down upon people. Because that is not a righteous attitude to have. You can rely on God to deliver you from really wicked people. But we never ought to think that we're better than other people because you're not, because you're still a sinner too. And we need to keep the humility. Yes, you can judge righteously. Yes, you don't have to be afraid to call sin a sin. And especially if you're not being a hypocrite and you're not involved in the same sin, to be able to just call it out and say, you know, fornication's wrong, it's wicked, or adultery's wrong, it's wicked, or whatever the sin may be, calling it out so people can know and fear and not get involved in that stuff. But at the same time, being able to, um, to not just look down your nose like the, like the man who said, you know, oh, I thank you, God, I'm not like this publican over here. I do these good things and this good things, and I, and I, but I'm not like this guy over here. We don't have that attitude. We remain humble. But even in humility, you can judge righteous judgment. 
And when you get to the point to where you're able to say, God, judge me, that will also to help keep you humble. Because before you go to God and say something like that, you ought to be really examining your life and making sure that you don't have something where God's going to be able to judge you with. Let's keep reading here in verse number 6. The Bible says, Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Now, I want to I wanna pay a little bit of attention to this. Because David just got done basically saying, look, I haven't done anything wrong, but I'm being persecuted. God, judge them. You know, judge me and deliver me from what they're doing. And now he's going to ask for God's judgment upon his enemies. Why? Because he's righteous, because he's being, he's being unjustly persecuted. And instead of taking matters in his own hands, he goes to God. Because that's the right thing to do. He goes to God to ask for help. But notice this. You remember from last week, Psalm 6, verse number 1, David said, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. When God's going to discipline us as his children, we don't want God being angry. And, and I covered that last week. We want, we want God to be not just full of wrath when he, when he goes to discipline us. And David's asking for mercy in Psalm 6. But look at the, the change when he's now referring to his enemies, when he's done everything right, yet he's still being persecuted. He says, arise, like, get up, God, and judge. He says, arise, O Lord, in thine anger. He's not asking God to put aside his anger when he judges you. He says, arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Lift up thyself. But why? Why is, it, why is he asking him to do this for God to get angry and to judge? Because of the rage of mine enemies. He's saying, because their rage against me is so bad, God, I want you to get angry with them. I want you to bring the judgment upon them in your anger and to deliver me because of the rage of mine enemies and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about for their sakes, therefore, return thou on high. And of course, we see, we saw verse number eight where he says to God, you know, judge me. See how I'm doing, Lord. Help me, you know, um, you, you know my works. You know my heart. Let's keep reading here. Verse number nine. The Bible says, oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end but establish the just for the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. Now, we all should know this already, but it does us good to remember this. You know, it basically is asking for the wicked to, to come to an end. God establish the just, lift up the just, help the just for the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. God knows your heart. God knows where your heart is today. Getting your heart right will help you to get everything else right in your life. For example, maybe some of you weren't very happy or didn't really want to come to church this evening. Maybe that was in your heart. You say, I don't really want to go. When you start off with that type of an attitude, because your desires, that's a desire of your heart when you say, I don't want to do this. God knows your heart. But what follows from that is, well, I don't really want to go. When you don't want to go, you're going to be a lot less likely to want to listen. You're not going to want to hear God's word. You're not going to want to sing the praises unto God. You're not going to want to do the things that God wants you to do. You're not going to be in the spirit. You're going to be in the flesh. And it all starts just with your heart. And then everything that you do, I mean, that's just one small example. That's just like, you know, coming to church. Just anything in your life, think about where your heart is at. Anything you have to deal with, where is your heart? Where, where is your heart at? Is it with God? Or not? Or is it just in your own pleasure? Is it just in, in whatever is going to feel good? Is it just in gratifying the flesh? 
See, if your heart's willing, your, your flesh is weak. So if your heart's not willing, you're going to be in the flesh, no doubt about it. But if you can get your heart right, if you can set your heart aright, if you could get your, your attitude right and desire the good things, the desire to walk in the Spirit, everything else will, will follow in place from there. God knows our hearts. God tries the hearts and the reins. He wants to know what's in your heart. He wants to know, are you true and are you genuine? Do you really want to serve the Lord? Or are you just going through the motions? Verse number 10, my defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. Look at verse number 11. God judgeth the righteous. Look, God's a judge. You say, yeah, but I'm righteous. What makes a man righteous anyways? But they're saved. God judges the righteous. Don't think that just because you're saved, you get away with everything. Sit up. Don't think that just because you're saved, you could get away with everything. That God doesn't care. Oh, well, I'm saved. You know, I'm once saved, always saved. And do we believe that? Amen. We are saved. And no matter what you do, you're going to heaven. Amen. But don't think that you can just say, well, I'm just going to go off and sin then. What, shall we continue in sin that, that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we, which are dead to sin, live any longer therein? God does judge his people. God will bring judgment. Just because your judgment isn't going to be in the lake of fire doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a fear of God in your life. God judgeth the righteous. But look at the next part of this verse. And God is angry with the wicked every day. We know that God is love. We know that God has plenty of love. God, God is very long-suffering. God is very merciful. God is forgiving. But God also has anger and wrath. And the Bible says here that he is angry with the wicked every day. Not with the deeds of the wicked. He's angry with the wicked. With the people. There are people that God is angry with on a daily basis. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be on God's bad side. I don't want to deal with the, with the chastisement and the punishment that God will dole out because he's angry with me, maybe living like I'm wicked. Verse number 12, if he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. And this is another just great truth in this world. You don't even have to be a Bible believer to see that this is true, but the Bible just spells it out so eloquently. And it's that same concept of reaping what you sow. The wicked are going to get what's coming to them. And we need to know this and remember this and don't forget it as children of God, that God will not let the wicked go unpunished. Do not be discouraged by the wickedness and the evil that you see around you. Don't get discouraged by these lunatics that go off and shoot a bunch of people or anything like that and think that they're going to get off easy because you know what? God is going to right every wrong. God makes everything work. Um, that's the way that he made this, this earth. That what, basically what goes around comes around. You reap what you sow. And we see in multiple places, and you'll see through the book of Proverbs, and you'll see in the book of Psalms, as it says right here, that the, you know, this wicked person made a pit. It says he made a pit and digged it. Meaning that here's someone who's setting a trap. He's going to hurt someone else, and he's setting a trap, and he's trying to, trying to deceive people and hurt people and, and uh, you know, cause them to fail or to steal from them. And what happens? He ends up falling into the trap himself. 
His own wickedness comes back on his own head. That's why it says, he made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch which he made. It's a similar teaching to basically, hey, you want to live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. The things that you do, it's going to come back and bite you. People who love to steal from others will usually end up getting stolen from and in a much bigger way. People that like to hurt people, guess what? That's coming back and they're going to get hurt in a much bigger way. And the wicked person that's out there just, just causing pain and inflicting evil and, and, and just all kinds of wrongdoing against people, if they don't get that in this lifetime, it'll come back to them in the next lifetime, meaning not reincarnation, but while they're burning in a lake of fire. All the pain that was inflicted on others, they're going to reap what they've sown. We could take comfort knowing that God does not allow... You know, even though forgiveness, and, and this is what's important to understand about forgiveness, and I probably should have brought this up a different way. I was out soul winning today, and I talked to a lady at the door, and um, wasn't saved, she wasn't saved, she was believing in, in her works, and I kind of explained, gave her some Bible verses and explained, you know, that once you're saved, you're saved forever and that, it, you know, Jesus paid for all of our sins and we just need to, to, to fully trust in him. And of course, she had like a faith plus works type of a salvation, which, uh, which is just works salvation. And, um, and she said, well, and I asked her because she wasn't giving me a lot of feedback. I said, well, what do you think about these things? Did you agree with them? Do you think it's a little bit different? She said, well, I think it's a little bit different. So what do you mean? So, well, and then she brought up that the shooter in Florida. You know, a kid goes in and, and shoots up some, some people at high school and basically saying, I don't know how someone like that can get to heaven. And I explained, first of all, that one thing I think everybody has a problem with is looking at their own sin for how bad it really is. Because most people will think, well, I'm not a bad person. I haven't done anything that bad. And that's, that was my mentality before I got saved was, well, I'll go to heaven because, I mean, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't done anything that bad. Without realizing that the sins that I did, though they may not have been murder, in God's eyes still deserved a punishment of an eternity in hell. Even in my young life that I had only lived up to that in my short 20 years of existence on this earth. For a long time, I just, well, I'm going to heaven because I'm pretty good. But once we understand, no, God says even, you know, all liars. Say, let, let's say all you've done is told a lie. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We need to have the proper perspective on our own sin to, one, realize that we need a Savior because we deserve this punishment of hell. But the reason why I was bringing this up and, and you know, the salvation, I know you guys know this, but when we understand that there is this great punishment, that the wicked will get what's coming to them. While God offers forgiveness through Jesus Christ to not have to face that punishment, it's not like that punishment went unpaid. The only difference is who took the punishment. See, we have an opportunity to not have to pay that punishment of hell on our own. Thankfully, because God loves us. Because God wants us to be saved. But the punishment was paid. It was paid in full by our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll just bring this up real quick. It's, um, unfortunately, it's not as commonly taught as it ought to be.
But when Jesus Christ died for our sins, the Bible says He bare the sins of the whole world in His own body on the tree. He took our sins on Himself. He shed His blood to pay for our sins. He shed His blood for us. Yes, He did. He died on that cross. But that is not where the full, just, just absolutely everything stopped in order to, to satisfy our sins. It didn't stop there. It's a full package. Is the blood necessary? You better believe the, the blood is necessary. But the resurrection is necessary also. He had to conquer death and hell. He had to come back to life. He also had to go to hell. Acts chapter 2 is very, very clear about this. Verse 31 says, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. And I got news for you. In order for someone's soul to, be left, to, to not be left in hell, it had to be in hell. Neither his flesh should see corruption. Jesus Christ's soul was not left in hell because he rose from the dead. And that's why it says, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection. When Jesus Christ came up from the dead, his soul was not left in hell. Because it was in hell. Why? Because he bare the sins of the whole world and took our sins to hell and paid for our sins in hell. The sin is not unpunished. The sin was punished in full. Which ought to give us that much more love and respect and should work in your heart to want to do more, to want to come to church, to want to get right, to want to have the type of an attitude that can say, judge me, O God, because I'm so thankful for what you've done that now I'm going to live for you. I'm going to offer up my body a living sacrifice and I'm going to serve you, Lord, daily because I love what you did for me and that you took all of my sins, all the wicked things that I've done and paid for them on the cross, Lord. Now I'm going to live for you. Now I'm going to do what's right because I'm humbled and I'm thankful for the gift that you've given me that I don't deserve and that nobody deserves. Verse number 17, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. We're going to get into this more in other Psalms. But don't forget, the book of Psalms is a song book. This is a song. God wants us singing. We ought to praise the Lord. We ought to be happy and joyful for our salvation, for everything I just mentioned. We ought to sing praises to the name of the Lord Most High. And I'll say this right now, if you, if you don't sing praises unto God, especially you know, singing praises in the midst of the congregation and singing praises to God, I don't think you're right with God. We ought to learn these songs and sing them. You ought to want to sing them out of your heart. You ought not to be, feel like, oh, I just have to sing just so I can be right with God. I just have to do this and it's a drudgery. Get your heart right. Maybe if you're not comfortable singing, maybe you feel like you don't have a great voice or whatever the reason, or you think, well, I don't really like this music that much. First, but before you, 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 know, you start, you deal with this type of a problem, think in your heart what Jesus has done for you and how much praise God is worthy of. That he's worthy of us singing praises unto his name. He's worthy of all this, this great exaltation. Think about how much he's done for you and has saved your soul from hell. And maybe that will help to get your heart right and motivated to say, you know what? I, I think God does deserve recognition. I think God deserves to have me maybe feel like a fool for a minute to give him glory and honor. Maybe I can humble myself enough to not worry about what other people think about the way that I sound and this isn't for them anyways. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sing out to God because I love God and I want to praise God and I think that God deserves that especially in his house among his people. We'll get into all the more reasons why we ought to sing and how the biggest book of the Bible is a song book. But I just wanted to mention that tonight as we're in Psalm 7. 
because he has closes out his, his plea to God of, of judging the wicked and saving him and delivering him with this, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for saving us, for saving our souls. God, I thank you for um, all that you've done for us. Lord, I, I pray that you would please help us to be able to stand in righteousness, to, to, to clean up our lives enough, to be walking in the spirit enough, to be willing to say, Lord, judge me. Lord, try my heart. See if there's any wickedness in me, dear Lord. And, and if there be, then, then I'm not going to resist the punishment that's inflicted on me, dear Lord. But if it's not, I just ask that you would judge righteously and that you would, you would deliver me from the affliction that's going on. Help us to be able to have that type of an attitude and be able to make those type of bold statements when we are going through persecutions or trials, dear Lord. Help us to be able to be at that place as David was, to be able to boldly say those things. Lord, help us to make righteous judgments. And God, we love you and we thank you for being a God of justice. And we thank you for, for the great gift of our salvation. Help us to, to get our hearts right and to sing uh, songs and praises on your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.